Hi, it's Wesley with 22 Zines. Happy Pride Month. I have a few things coming up for that, but right now I wanted to make this kind of impulsive video that was based on one of Lisa Pepez's polls for a series she does called This or That, where she compares two decks that fill a similar niche in her collection and decides which one that she's going to keep and which one she's going to get rid of. Or sometimes both, sometimes neither. And the most recent poll that I saw was for the Oracle of the Radiant Sun, which is in comparison with another deck that I can't remember the name of, but that's not important. Um, and I wanted to put a word in for the Oracle of the Radiant Sun because I love this deck very much. It is one of my absolute favorites. It was one of the first decks that I got. Like, it was one of my first five or something that I ever purchased. And... I think a lot of people have it and a lot of people like it. I also think that a lot of people are perhaps a little bit stuck on how to use it. Um, it is very structured. It is structured based around traditional astrology. So um, each card is uh, one of the planets and one of the signs. So it is the moon in Leo, for example, and it has the moon in Virgo, the moon in Libra, etc. And it goes so on and so forth. And it has, it uses the uh, seven traditional astrology planets. So that's the sun and the moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And uh, with that, it assigns each one a keyword based on the sort of conceptual combination of two keywords. So each planet essentially forms a suit and each uh, sign is a different keyword that combines with the suit. So the sun is the suit of fortune and it combines with Aries, which is self-will. And when you put fortune and self-will together, you get assertion. And that's sort of what the structure is like and what the description is based on. The guidebook is fabulous. <laughs> I really love the guidebook. And in it, it has sort of a description of personal, uh, it will say, you know, for example, sun and Aries people have a strong psychological drive to prove themselves through direct action. And it goes on and on. And at the very end, it has a short keyword-based list of events. So how you might read the card if you pulled it for an event and thus use it as a more traditional oracle deck. Um, so what I wanted to do is offer a collection of possible ways that you could read with this deck, possible uses for it, uh, because as much as I love laying out my... Uh, birth chart, I there are some other ways that you can use it uh, that can either help you study astrology, if that's something that you want to move towards. It can be uh, help as a development for personal exploration, personal growth. It can be used for everyday divination and advice. Uh, there are really a lot of uses for it. And so I wanted to throw some of those out there in case you have this deck and you're kind of struggling with... Uh, how to use it. Uh, fun fact is that I actually started with astrology and I was really into astrology and that was sort of my main uh, <laughs> grounding point and then moved on to tarot where I know a lot of people got into astrology because of the astrological associations with tarot cards. Uh, but anyway, that is one reason why I especially love the Oracle of the Radiant Sun is because I feel like it does a really good job of offering in-depth uh, possibilities for exploration of astrology, uh, but I think it's also accessible for beginners and it's also accessible as just a usable oracle. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. This box, by the way, is just one that I made myself and stamped on it because the regular box is very large and I just didn't want to deal with it. So um, for anyone who has not seen this deck before, these are the cards. These are the card Backs. I know there's an older edition that has slightly different uh, card backs and card stock. Uh, this one is a glossy-ish finish. Um, so you are going to see the reflection of my ring light on, on them as we go forward, but that's okay. I'll be splitting up the video into a few different categories of how you can use it. Uh, so to start off, we're going to do how you might use this deck for astrological study. The first thing that you can do is something that you probably already did when you opened it up, or at least that was my first instinct, is to use the cards to lay out your own 
astrological birth chart. <laughs> um, so here uh, I've arranged these in my birth chart. Uh, sun in Libra is harmony, moon in Virgo is order, Mercury in Libra is influence, etc, etc. And uh, this I all is an activity <laughs> that I always like going back to, even though I've become pretty acquainted with my own chart and some of the intricacies. It uh, serves as a nice reminder, I guess, of what each of these means and, and sort of a visual visual cues and very basic keyword cues um, to act as sort of an anchor in seeing how astrological things will apply to me. So of course, laying out your own birth chart or uh, the chart of someone close to you or the chart of someone not close to you is a very natural thing that you can do with this deck. It's obviously very well built for that. Another thing that you can do with the cards is to lay out a single sign in each of the planets to learn a little bit more about that sign and how it expresses itself. So here I chose Cancer just randomly, and you can see in the Cancer in Sun is resourcefulness, the Cancer in Moon is friendship, the Cancer in uh, Mercury is intuition, and it goes on and you can sort of get a sense of the overall themes of that particular sign and how they may play out in different situations. Like, for example, um, Cancer in Saturn is charity. And so you think about, that can, that can sort of help you think about if you know Saturn to be a sign of structure and discipline and also ambition. I believe ambition is the keyword that they use in the book for, um, for Saturn. And you think of Cancer as being kind other oriented and uh, building relationships and building attachments with people, then it makes sense that when you combine the two, you have the drive to nurture attach attachment and the ambition and structure to do so that it turns into the, um, the act of charity or of um, offering your resources and your structure to uh, in service of others to nurture attachment with others. Um, on the other hand, you can see uh, the Cancer in Mars, and that turns into a coral. And you think of, uh, again, Cancer as being nurturing attachment and very centered around relationships with, with others and sort of emotional relationships. And you think of Mars as being the suit of drive and force and oftentimes argument then it sort of makes sense that it would turn into a quarrel where you are you are arguing with someone or you are fighting with somebody because you care about them, because you are trying to build a relationship with them, and um, when you have disagreements, then it becomes a very um, personal, emotional one, and that's sort of why it's quarrel and not simply fighting or some other sort of fighting. Anyway, so you can kind of, when you combine the two then, when you look at Cancer in Mars and Cancer in Saturn as these two different ways, you see, okay, it starts to paint a picture of um, the nature of Cancer as being relationships with others and emotionally invested relationships with others. So it kind of paints a picture about what Cancer um, as a sign is and and how it plays out in different situations and it just can really get a handle help you get a handle on the multiple facets of each individual sign and of course you can do this with any sign and of course just as you can lay out all of one particular sign in each planet you can lay out all the signs of a particular planet <laughs> um, so here I've laid out, I'm not sure if you can see all of the cards in frame, but I've laid out all 12, 12 of the Jupiter cards to get a look at them and to get sort of an understanding of, or a better understanding of um, what Jupiter is as a filter and how different signs, how it affects the way that any sign may express itself. So some of the keywords that we have are principle, Publicity, status, negotiation, control, innovation, enterprise, manipulation, patience, seduction, bluff. Okay, that's all of them. Um, but you sort of, just purely based on those keywords, you can kind of get a picture of what Jupiter is. It seems to be very, um, very outward focused. You have a lot of, you know, publicity, negotiation involves multiple people, status is about sort of... Um, 
in relation to other people, usually. Um, you can see that Jupiter is generally about um, expansion, and that's why you have things like enterprise, innovation, control, publicity. You know, these are things about about expanding, and, and that is a very common keyword that's used for Jupiter. Um, and, you know, I won't get too far into it, but basically you can do this with any of the planets to get a better picture of what the planet is. And of course, for any of these examples, you can absolutely read some of the entries in the guidebook. It is a fabulous guidebook, and I recommend it for pretty much anything. Another thing you can do with this deck to help you learn astrology is to lay out cards that could potentially be in a particular relationship with each other. Um, if you're a beginner, this might be easier with an example chart, um, just so that you don't have to come up with them on your own. But for example, you could try laying out cards in a trine, or in a sextile, in a square, in opposition, like in any of the relationships to see how uh, it might play out in a particular way. So here I've laid out a pretend trine. Um, by the way, this trine is actually impossible um, because the Sun and um, Mercury will only be at most one sign apart from each other, so this can't actually happen. But just for the sake of, of playing pretend here, uh, let's say that you have a uh, Sun in Virgo and that represents health. You have a moon in Taurus, and that represents exaltation. And you have a Mercury in Capricorn, which is organization. Um, each of these are Earth signs, and so they're going to be in a harmonious trine relationship with each other. Um, a trine basically forms a triangle on uh, the birth chart, and that is the way that the elements are arranged, are such that um, uh, the same element will always be in a trine with the sign of of the same element, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But the point is, you can kind of see this, and you can see how these kind of go. You can you can look at ways that these go together. So how does organization and health go together? Um, it, you can even look at the images of this particular card and see sort of the organization of being on a farm and of growing things and uh, generally like trying to organize something for the purpose of of creating something. Uh, that is a very Mercury thing because Mercury is an air sign and so it is going to be focused on a sort of intellectual creation of things. And you can combine that, or, or you can compare that rather, with the uh, Sun in uh, Virgo, which is going to be focused on health. And you can see, okay, well, uh, that's, that's going to be a part of health. And um, organization is a way that will... Health can be supported through organization. And organization can um, be supported from health. If you have uh, healthy balance, healthy habits, and, and healthy living, and I don't mean like literally, <laughs> but you know, just in, in general, um, how, how might health help you organize? And you can see how, you know, these are not keywords that are in opposition to each other, how might they help each other? Because a trine is a, a harmonious relationship. And you can bring in the moon and Taurus of exaltation and this uh, abundance that you see in this card and see how that might be um, supported by organization, for example, or see how health and exaltation, how might those go together? And it's just sort of an interesting way to uh, look at, get a, get sort of a, 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 some examples and some, some easily randomizable examples of what a trined relationship might look like. Uh, and of course, you can do this for anything. You can do this for oppositions. You can do this, for, you know, in fact, let me actually, let me pull up an opposition for you. So here I've pulled up an example of an opposition. We are keeping the sun in Virgo here, which is still health, and then the opposition to that, or an opposition to that, would be the Saturn in Pisces. Um, Virgo and Pisces are in opposition to each other, which just means that on a birth chart they are directly on opposite sides of each other, and that is usually considered a difficult relationship because they are in tension of sorts. Um, so you have you can kind of picture that because Virgo is very detail-oriented, very focused, and very um, concerned with building structures for understanding and stability, whereas Pisces is a lot more dreamlike, it's a lot more flowing and intuitive, 
and that doesn't always uh, mix well <laughs> with Virgo sensibilities. And so you can kind of see here one way in which they might um, have difficulties with each other is that when you have uh, health and loss, those those are often difficult when when paired together. Um, like how would I put this? You'd have, you know, if you go through a loss, then that has impacts on your health. If you have negative health, then that can lead to a loss of some kind. And um, you can see how health and loss, they are not necessarily inherently opposites, um, but they do have a sort of tension. And so you can play with the different kinds of tensions that can exist between two cards uh, if you lay out these sort of hypothetical oppositions. So that's one thing that this deck can be used for, is just to lay out different relationships or uh, different potential relationships between planets based on whether they are trined or squared or in opposition, etc. Um, so that you can get a sense of um, how that relationship uh, may affect things, how or how the relationship may play out. Another thing you can do that can sort of help you get more intuitive about astrology while you're continuing to learn it is um, go through this deck and you can try to lay out a harmonious fake chart. <laughs> lay out a harmonious chart purely based on the keywords and the images and just how you feel about each card. Um, so rather than intentionally looking for trines, looking for whatever relationships, you can just go through the deck and, you know, pick, let's, let's base this sort of around the sun um, in Leo, which is fortune. And then we can go over to the moons and we can think of one that, you know, what would be a harmonious uh, complement to fortune? Like what, what card would go well with it? I think optimism, that's an excellent one. Optimism and fortune go very well with each other. Um, so we'll just put the moon as the moon in Sagittarius and optimism. And we can keep going with that. So you know, what would be a good Mercury for that? What would be a useful thing? What would be a harmonious relationship uh, between that? Um, excitement might be a good one. And you can just kind of keep going through the entire deck and uh, do one for each planet. You can think of, you know, perhaps discrimination would be a good thing to be able to discern between things. Uh, so it's not mindless ambition. Anyway, so I won't keep going through and pick one for everyone, but you'd pick one for each, um, each of the planets, and then you can look at them and you can see what the relationships actually would be if they were laid on a chart. So in this case, you can see, well, Fortune in Leo and Moon in Sagittarius, those two are both fire signs, and so they're going to be in a trine with each other, and that's going to be a harmonious relationship. And again, then you can go back to what we did before of how we laid out a trine, and you can consider how fortune and optimism might relate to each other. Uh, you can also bring in, uh, you know, discrimination, Venus in Virgo. Uh, how does that connect with, um, with Leo? Uh, Venus and Leo, those are going to be in uh, conjunction with each other, I believe. I, I sometimes have a hard time if I'm not looking at an actual um, chart, but anyway, like you, you can look at the different relationships between the cards based on this hypothetical thing, and you can kind of uh, hone your intuition about uh, about how how to read a chart, what stands out as especially positive, what stands out as neutral, what stands out as negative in a birth chart. And my last activity for using this deck to further your astrological study would be to randomly choose uh, one card from each planet, so I have each of these separated into the planets here, and then try to make up a story or make up a picture of the person that might have these qualities. and essentially try to reverse engineer a person from this pretend uh, birth chart or reverse the story. So here we have the sun in Cancer, which is resourcefulness, the moon in Gemini, which is adaptability, Mercury in Aries, which is restlessness, Venus in Aries, which is lust, Mars in Virgo, which is criticism, Jupiter in Virgo, which is patience, and Saturn in Aries, which is risk. 
So you can kind of get a look at these and see a few connections. So obviously one of the first thing that jumps out to me is that we have three planets in Aries, um, which is kind of a lot. And so you think, okay, well that person would probably have a lot of fiery, fiery, um, fiery energy <laughs> about them. I'm not sure how else to say it. Um, and you can sort of combine restlessness, lust, and risk, and you can see, um, you know, restlessness is going to be having to do with the mind. So they're probably incredibly curious, but also um, may have difficulty with committing themselves to uh, studying a particular thing and may just always be on the move. And you can see how that might play out in romantic relationships also. You can also see how the, although there is a lot of um, hard-headed Aries energy here in the, in the chart, you also have uh, the sun in Cancer, which is a water sign and which sort of tempers that. And you can see someone who is also resourceful and caring about other people. And so perhaps it is that uh, because they want so desperately to care and form a, a concrete relationship with somebody that they have difficult difficulty with, um, with not commitment to one person, but with sort of a, uh, a, uh, having realistic expectations of one other person. You can see that because of uh, Aries in Venus, where it's like they want to be head over heels in love and have a very passionate relationship, but they also have this tendency to be critical and um, to be very discerning and, and um, that can play out negatively in their relationships. I mean, you could see a lot of different things in this chart and the purpose is to sort of try to get an idea of um, how all of these individual cards can come together to form a particular person. Um, this is really fun for anybody of any skill level, but it might feel a little more accessible if you are a little more familiar with astrology so you have a good basis. Um, but at the same time, even if you don't, then the keywords themselves tell a lot about the person. They are resourceful, adaptable, perhaps restless, lustful, um, tend towards criticism, and yet they are very patient, but they are willing to take risk. You can, you can see a little bit about this person and how all these words can come together to form a, a picture of one person. So of course the Oracle of the Radiant Sun is itself an Oracle deck, and you can use it pretty much as you would any other Oracle deck. Um, one of my personal favorite ways to use it is uh, sort of in, in lieu of a tarot deck, or rather in combination with a tarot deck, to uh, get a piece of advice from each of the planets. And you can either ask yourself um, particular questions that are sort of themed to uh, each planet in the way that you might ask Venus, um, how can I love myself more? Or, uh, you know, how how can I learn about how to be in a relationship with somebody? What do I need to hear about, about my relationships? You can ask yourself about Mars, you know, how can I stand up for myself more? Or just sort of a more general, you know, what do I need to hear about uh, my my drive, you know? And, and so you can ask yourself individual questions if you want to, or not, or you can just pull one from each one and just see what each planet has to say. Um, so just as an example, <laughs> we got Sun in Libra, we have Moon in Scorpio, we have Mercury in Aquarius, we have Venus in Virgo, we have Mars in Aries, Jupiter in Aquarius, and Saturn in Capricorn. So um, from this, I would say the Sun is a sort of the central card, and so I would say that right now what I am what I am feeling is very harmonious. I'm feeling relatively balanced and I am it's sort of like my, my central theme card right now. Um, I can see from the moon, maybe what I need emotionally is to connect with my sense of power and to feel like I'm more, um, not necessarily in control of outcomes of things, but just, uh, yeah, that I, that I remind myself of my own power and that I, I feel powerful. That's sort of what I need on an emotional level, as that's what's that's sort of what the moon represents. Um, Mercury in Aquarius, maybe um, Mercury is sort of about thought and also about uh, creativity. 
And this is something that I'm often concerned with in my work is originality. I really want to create something original. I really want to um, do new and interesting things. And that is something that perhaps I can look for more ways to integrate. Or if I'm sort of put off by that card, I can question, do I really need to be focused on originality? Or is what I need to focus on more uh, doing what I want, regardless of whether it's the most original thing in the world. It sort of depends on how you feel about the card that's turned over. Um, with Venus and Virgo uh, about discrimination, I see this as maybe I'm being too hard on myself. Maybe I'm being too picky about my my expectations and it's making it difficult for me to love myself um, uh, sort of without... Um, uh, exceptions or, or without requirements. So uh, perhaps putting that discriminating work to use in another way could be useful for me. And again, that's something that sort of depends on how you how you feel about the card that's turned over. Uh, you know, do, does this put you off? Does this feel like an issue for you? Does this feel like something you're doing well? That sort of thing. Um, Mars and Aries, uh, perhaps I'm being a little impulsive right now. Uh, Saturn or Jupiter, <laughs> sorry, Jupiter in Aquarius. Um, again, innovation that sort of connects with the idea of originality. And I feel like the idea of innovation and originality, they sort of feel like a big deal because Jupiter is sort of the, the embiggener. <laughs> and um, so that can sort of uh, feel like a very big deal in my life. And uh, I also see Jupiter as kind of good luck. So maybe this is something I'm doing well right now. Um, Saturn in Capricorn being about riches. That is something that I've been thinking. I've been thinking about money a lot lately. How can this apply to the way that you're thinking about money? I need to think about money less as about riches and more as a different purpose because Saturn isn't inherently about money. It's about structure. And do I believe that riches are going to offer me a certain structure? Anyway, um, I've been blabbering on a lot for an example, but you get the idea is that you can get a lot of meaning uh, from doing an advice from the planets sort of uh, spread like this. And of course, if you if you can't get all of that right off the bat, there is, of course, a fabulous guidebook that can give you more information about any particular uh, card that you've pulled. I really like using this deck to intentionally pull cards, as in look at them and select one out as opposed to pulling one randomly. And one way that I like to do that is to pick a card for each planet that is what I want to be, or qualities that I wish to have, um, and then see what that says. So right now if I'm flipping through the sun, achievement is a big deal for me. That's something that I often wish to have in a quality or, or you know, a, a result that I wish to see in my life. Um, you can go through and do the same thing for Moon and say, okay, adaptability, companionship, like, what does it feel like I'm missing? What stands out to me? You can do this as an image or, um, ooh, this one, this image in particular really stands out to me, and that's about friendship. And that definitely feels like something that I need emotionally right now. And so anyway, I'm not going to bother to pull one from each one, but you can intentionally pick one from each of the, um, each of the planets to feel like this is what I want my life to be like. Uh, that can make some interesting comparisons to your birth chart. If I see the sun in Capricorn as achievement, my ascendant is in Capricorn. So I often relate to a lot of sun in Capricorn things. Um, but that doesn't always blend well with, uh, with my, um, sun in Libra. So you can do that, or you can just see it in general and see, you know, what does this say about me that this is the card that I pull, you know, if this is the image or the card that, that is drawn out, what does that say about me right now? What, what is it telling me about myself? Uh, you know, this idea of sort of of friendship and this very calm and peaceful card coming out as something that I also want. It seems like I'm looking for a sense of structure and achievement, but I'm also looking for that in a balanced sense where that doesn't prevent me from meeting other people and from having deep connections with other people. Um, perhaps these two can be in conflict. And anyway, it just goes for a good launching point because you know that the card that you've selected is going to have a certain meaning for you.
Okay, so I did go ahead and pull one for each of them because I wanted to talk about another way that you could compare them is that if you're pulling cards um, to represent what you want or what you feel that you need, you can sort of look for connections and see you know, what do they have in common, uh, perhaps elementally, like one thing that I noticed is that there are four cards here that are earth cards that I, that I was sort of gravitated towards. And so that suggest what does, what does that suggest is that, um, maybe I'm looking for a little, uh, stability and looking for a sort of grounded, groundedness in a certain way. Um, also, but you know, that, that doesn't exactly go along with the Mercury and Leo, which is drama. So maybe I need some sort of intellectual fire and passion and, and dramatism to sort of, uh, push me towards things. Uh, the point is that you can, you can look at your results on an elemental level. You could also look at them on a cardinality level where, um, you can see, are the, are they cardinal signs that you've picked or are they fixed signs um you know these are uh it seems to be kind of a lot of mutable signs or maybe not maybe it's pretty balanced because i have i have three cardinals actually anyway the i won't get into it too much <laughs> um i have three cardinals two fixed and two mutable um so you could you could look at it that way. You you can get a lot from the structure of astrology that uh, gives us a depth to these readings that you you don't get with a lot of oracle cards, and that's part of why I really love this deck. A few other questions that you could ask yourself in the personal exploration category, where you could basically do the same thing, is uh, you could pick a card for each planet that represents how you see yourself, and you can compare that to your birth chart um, for some other interesting insights. Um, like for example, if I were to choose Sun in Capricorn as achievement and compare it to uh, Harmony, you know, if I see myself as having achieved things, or, or you know, I see I see myself in this card in some way, and then I compare it to uh, my card of Harmony, then do those things go together? Do I feel like uh, I can have both achievement and harmony. Do I feel more harmonious when I have achieved something? Am I neglecting a certain balance? You can ask yourself a lot of questions like that. And I think that just pulling how you see yourself can provide some pretty interesting insights um, when you have this other structure that you can look into. You know, perhaps if I pulled this entire thing for how I see myself, then perhaps I would see myself as being especially earthy, even though I don't have a lot of earth in my chart, that sort of thing. You can also ask yourself um, questions about what you are afraid of. You can ask uh, what your goals are or, or what, you're, what you're, you feel that your goal, what you, what you want your goals to be. Um, a lot of little questions like that, and you can do that for from each of the planets for personal growth. Or another option is that you could combine the entire deck. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that now. You can combine the whole deck and uh, pull any number of cards that you like. You could pull seven again, or you could pull fewer. And you could um, go through again and pull them intentionally and then see if any planets come up multiple times or if any planets and signs come up multiple times. Like here, um, I pulled these randomly, but you could, if I had pulled these, you could see there's two moons here and Venus, which I feel like, um, has a lot of similar qualities to the moon. So, um, what does that tell you about whatever question you asked, whether it's how you see yourself, what you want, what you're afraid of, um, that sort of thing. Another spread that you can do is one that's actually shared in the guidebook. And I have done this a couple times and it's really, really interesting, uh, is that you can do a year ahead spread with each card, with 12 cards, with each of them representing one particular month. So <laughs> this one's been coming up a lot today, hasn't it? You, resourcefulness, exaltation, secrets. You can pull each of these cards and do a full uh, 12, you know, one for each month and see as these can be the individual themes of each month, or you could ask yourself particular questions of each month. Uh, it has a little bit more about this in the back of the guidebook, so I won't go too far into it, but I do recommend that you take a look at the spreads that it offers in the guidebook, because they are actually quite good. 
Another thing that you can do is a similar thing to before, but separate the cards by a particular sign. And uh, you could use the sign that we are currently in and use that to ask how the upcoming uh, month would look like. Uh, so for example, we're in Gemini season right now, so I pulled out all the Gemini cards and we got Venus in Gemini, which is flattery. So that could tell you a little bit about perhaps this is a month to focus on Venus or when uh, issues related to <laughs> Venus of love relationships and interconnectedness um, might come up for you. You could look at uh, this could be a season of flattery for you uh, and how that might pay, play out in different ways, whether uh, you have a tendency to flatter other people um, without really flattering yourself enough or focusing too much on other people. Another interesting thing is you could do this alongside a full moon or a new moon practice if you already have one and pull a card for the moon you you could even you could pull the card for the moon in whatever sign the moon is in so i believe that the moon is in gemini right now so you could go through and look for what the moon in gemini is and get a reading based on that um you could do uh just the sign again you could say we're in gemini right now so you could just pull another random one for the moon in Gemini to see what the what the next moon cycle is going to be like, or even just the next few days while the moon is in that sign. Um, there's a lot of really interesting connections that you can make to pull one of these alongside another tarot practice or another um, moon-centered practice. And frankly, this deck's guidebook is so fabulous that I think it is really good just for one-card readings, which you can either integrate as a theme with a uh, tarot spread or not. But for example, let's just pull it off the top. Venus in Capricorn as convention. You can talk about conventionality uh, as it relates to whatever your tarot spread is doing, or you can just read the guidebook and you can see what it has to say. There it was. About convention. Common sense sign of Cap Venus in the common sense sign of Capricorn describes someone who needs a romantic partner to share and help them achieve ambitions. Um, you can consider what all this has to do. You can consider the keywords of love, duty, and perseverance and how they relate to each other. Or you can even just like meditate on the keyword of convention. And um, I think that's still a, a very expansive and wonderful keyword to use. I think it can be kind of easy because this deck has a structure to feel limited by the structure in some way, but really you can just use this as you would any other Oracle deck and it works fabulously. So um, try, you know, try not to be intimidated too much by the um, planets and the signs. Even if you don't know anything about the planets or the signs, you can still get a very good and interesting Oracle card reading just from the keyword alone. So those are a few ways that I use the absolutely amazing Oracle of the Radiant Sun and ways that you can too. I hope that this has given you some inspiration to work with this deck if you have it languishing in your collection or just uh, different ways that you can integrate astrology with divination, astrology with card pulling, and um, how they can really support each other in a way that stems from astrology instead of stems from tarot. That's sort of another interesting thing about this is that the more that you learn about astrology through this deck, you can use those to help support your tarot readings. Uh, having a greater understanding of the sign of cancer might give you a greater understanding of the chariot card, for example. That's kind of a tricky one, but <laughs> anyway, um, I hope that you enjoyed these suggestions and I will be back soon. Bye!